Mother Deer. I love to hunt, and I I used to go up in the North Woods, up in New Hampshire, it's the home of the white-tailed deer. How I love to hunt them. And I used to go up every year, and I had a partner up there named Bert Call, one of the finest men I ever hunted with. And my nature has always been to the woods. I was born in the woods, and I just seemed like I was raised up there. And even my conversion never took it out of me. Not so much to get the game, but just to be in the woods. I think God is there to see him, how he moves, and the nature, how it dies, and goes down, comes back again. And resurrection, the sun comes up of a morning, a little baby born, and then about 9 o'clock it goes to school. About 10 o'clock it's finished. At 12 o'clock it's in its strength. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon it's getting along uh, about my age. At 5 o'clock it's 80 years old. It's dying. It goes down. It served God's purpose. It ain't dead. It'll come back the next morning. It's God testifying. There is a life, death, burial, resurrection. Watch them trees out there. Last fall, the sap went down into the root before any frost or anything else comes. What was it doing? Going down into the grave. What happens then? It comes back again in the spring. It isn't dead. It goes down and lays in the ground, comes back. If it stays up, then the winter will kill it. See, God has no intelligence of its own, sends it down there. It's God's provided way. Yes. So it just follows God's provided way. It goes down, hides in the winter, comes back again with new life next year, testifying there is a life, death, burial, resurrection. Everywhere it's the same thing. God in his great creation, testifying of himself. This hunter is a fine shot, a good shot, but he was the most cruelest man I ever met. He, he'd make fun of me all the time. He shot fawns. Now, not it's wrong to shoot a fawn if the law says so, but, you know, Abraham killed a calf and fed it to God, so it wasn't the, the sec or the, the size. It's the attitude. He'd shoot him just because it made me feel bad. And he'd say, oh, you're a chicken hearted like the other than preacher. He said, Billy, you'd be a good hunter if it wasn't you as a preacher. And said, but you're too chicken hearted. That's the way then preachers. said, they're, they're too chicken hearted. And I said, Bert, you're cruel. He had eyes like a lizard anyhow. And he said, he did, he, like the women try to paint their eyes, you know, up like that. And he said, and he looked over like that. And he said, you're just chicken hearted. So he'd shoot those little fawns and kill one, let it lay, and go right on and get another one just to make me feel bad. He said, I'll get you away from that preaching some of these days. And I said, no, oh, no, Bert. No, no. So one day I went up there one fall, and it's late. And a season had been in about a week, and I was busy. I was a state game warden in Indiana, and I had been busy and right in hunting season, so I had to get my vacation. I went up a little late, and uh, those white-tailed deer, if they're ever shot at, you talk about Houdini of being an escape artist. My, he's an amateur to them. And so then they really stay hid. And it had been moonlight nights, snow on the ground about six inches, trailing uh, work. So Bert, when he came down to the cabin where I was at, he said, Say, Billy, I got a good one this year for you. And I said, What? Reached down his pocket and pulled out. He had a little whistle. He had blow it, and it sounded just like a little fawn crying for its mother. A little baby deer, no crying for its mother. I said, Bert, how cruel can you be? I said, you mean you wouldn't do a thing like that? He said, ha ha, you chicken-hearted preacher. And uh, we went on hunting that day, and we went up over the Jefferson Notch, and you didn't have to worry about him. He knew how to find his way back. So we climbed up to about noon, and then we'd separate and go one one way and one the other, and then if we got our deer, we'd hang him up, and, and then we'd get our horses and go get him. So we got about 11 o'clock. We hadn't even seen a track, not one track. All the deer were laying down. they get in the brush and under the brush piles and things where the tops of the trees where the loggers had been. And they, would, uh, they was hide and stay away because they'd been shot at. They were scared. About 11 o'clock, birds stop, sit down. There's a little opening about all oh, size of this building and in the inside maybe twice the size. A little opening there and he sat down. And he reached back to get, I thought his, his thermos that he had in his, we usually carry a thermos and have some hot chocolate uh, because it's got fuel to it, you know, and, and then have a sandwich. Now we separate. We was getting up high towards Timberline, so I thought maybe that Bert was going to have his sandwich. So he sat down to pull out this thermos, and uh, I thought he was going to pull it out. And I just let, set my gun down against the tree and started at your mind. But what he was, he was getting that little whistle out. So when he got this little whistle out, he blew it. And anyone ever heard a little old baby fawn cry? It's kind of pitiful anyhow. And when he blew that whistle, to my surprise, right across from him, a great big mother doe stood up. Now, the, a doe is the mother deer. So she stood up, 
Here was her big brown eyes, these, leaf, these big ears pointed right up like that. See, her baby was in trouble. And he blew it again. And she looked around. And she walked right out into that opening. Now, that's unusual. Any of you hunters know that for a deer to do that. She walked out there. I could see her big eyes. She wasn't standing over 20 yards from me. And I thought, oh, Bert, you can't do that. And uh, kill that poor, precious mother. Her looking for her baby and you deceiving her like that. And this whistle had blown and she was, she walked out there. And the hunter raised the lever on his 3006 rifle, dropped it down, that cocked the gun, you know, with the safety off. And she heard that. And she looked around. And she saw the hunter. Her ears peeked right down. Usually they'd been gone. And she would have walked out there in the first place at that time of day. But you see, she was a mother. There was something in her. She, something genuine. Something she wasn't putting on no show. She was a mother. She was born a mother. And her baby was in trouble. That was to her interest. And he looked up at me with those lizard-looking eyes and the grin. I said, Bert, don't do it. Don't do it. He just grinned, turned around that rifle. Oh, my, he's a dead shot. And I know when that scope hair come across her loyal, motherly heart, he'd blow it plumb through her. See, she was standing 20 yards, big 180-grain green, green mushroom bullet in there. He would just blow her heart plumb through both sides. I thought, how can you be so cruel? as to blow that precious mother's heart out of her and her seeking her baby. How can you do that, Bert? I was thinking to myself. I seen his arms study down. I couldn't look at it. I just couldn't do it. I turned my back. I, I couldn't see that. That genuine, loyal mother standing there. She wasn't a hypocrite. She wasn't just putting it on for a sideshow. She was a mother. That's what she's doing. Death didn't mean nothing to her. The baby was in trouble. She thought more of her baby than she did of her own life. Let the hunter shoot whatever it was. Her loyal heart was beaten. Her motherhood, the motherhood in her was calling. Her baby was crying. There was something inside of her pulsating. It was real. And how could that cruel hunter blow that loyal heart out? I just couldn't see it. I turned my head. I thought, Lord God, don't let him do it. I was standing like this. I couldn't hear. I didn't want to hear the gun fire. It was just too much. I waited. The gun never fired. And I turned around and looked, and it's going like this. <laughs> he couldn't do it. He turned around and looked at me, and those big eyes had changed. Tears was running down his cheeks. He looked at me, and his lips quivering. He threw the gun on the snowbank, grabbed me into a trouser leg. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Lead me to that Jesus you're talking about. <laughs> there on that snowdrift, I led him to the Lord Jesus. Why? He saw something real. He'd been to all kinds of churches. He seen something that wasn't put on. He seen something that was genuine. Friends, we might have church rules and church regulations and theologies and everything else. But there's a real genuine Jesus. Yes.